three, two, one. Thanks everybody for watching and sharing the movie Tesla with us. We hope you enjoyed it, especially those on the grounds who enjoyed a little bit of lightning too. Uh, remember that Tesla will be opening in select theaters and on VOD on August 21st. So be sure to check your local listings and watch it at home. Um, now we're excited to move to the question and answer portion of our program. And I'm delighted to introduce you to our Q&A host, Mark Alessi, who is our executive director at Tesla Science Center. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Jane. I uh, want to thank IFC Films for helping us put on one remarkable Tesla birthday party here at Wardenclyffe. <laughs> uh, Wardenclyffe is the site of Tesla's last standing lab. We're turning Wardenclyffe into a museum and science center dedicated to Nikola Tesla and being able to celebrate his birthday with the pre-screening of this movie uh, was one remarkable way to do this. I am delighted to be joined here tonight with the writer and director of the film, Michael Almereda, uh, and also the stars of the film, Ethan Hawke, who starred as Nikola Tesla, and Kyle McLaughlin, who starred as Thomas Edison. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Thank you. So, Thanks, Mark. You know, we, you know, I was telling uh, some of you uh, earlier that uh, being able to watch this film and seeing a lightning show right above the screen was pretty surreal with everything that Tesla did in terms of trying to harness lightning and create lightning with his Tesla coils. But uh, if Tesla was here with us tonight, you know, one question, um, what, 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 what question would you want to ask Tesla tonight on his birthday? I'm, I'm going to start with Michael. It's, it's a great bewildering question. Um, but first I want to thank you for hosting this and I want to thank the IFC for supporting the film. I'm really glad it could be out in the elements with lightning flashing around the screen. That, that's very exciting to hear. Um, Tesla made so many public pronouncements and declarations that I wouldn't know exactly what to ask him. I'd be inclined to take him aside and ask him something more personal and private and human. And it would be something like, what does it feel to be Nikola Tesla? How does it, how is it that you can see into the fabric of reality and the forces of nature and, and the, um, have such deep perceptions and at the same time be consistently unable to connect to other human beings. So that was a way, in a way, the question we were asking throughout the film. And I would be curious to know how he himself would reflect on that, if he would ha how much awareness he would bring to that because, because he's a very mysterious man and that was part of the motivation of making the film is to edge a little closer to the mystery. Thank you. Uh, Ethan, what, what would you want to ask Tesla tonight if you had a chance? Well, I mean, it, it, it's one of those stunning questions that is so obvious, it feels like a hammer to the head, but I, I think I would talk to him about the pandemic, you know, I, about, there's something about the connection between science and art and religion and the meaning of life that, you, you know, my father's a mathematician and, and I've been an actor my whole life, but there's a meeting ground of where the sciences and arts meet. And I'd be curious what Nikola Tesla has to say about what we can learn about this moment. I mean, as a guy who is a famous germaphobe, I'm sure the, the new virus would be no surprise to him, but what he might say about how, how we could transform ourselves through this incubation period, uh, I would be super interested in what he had to say about how we could change. Yeah, so would I. Mm. And, uh, and Kyle, we'd like to throw that same question to you. Would you, would you have a question for Nikola Tesla tonight? If you well, I have two, actually. I, I want to know how he feels about Ethan Hawke playing him in this film. Because <laughs> I think he's pretty special. And uh, I, would, I would be really interested to learn more about the relationship that he had with Edison and what, what the issues were there and to hear him speak from his, from his side and, and uh, understand that. That was one of the really interesting, uh, I thought, angles that <clears throat> Michael 
wrote where he, in the film, he, there are what, there's what we know, of course, and then there's, what, there's the what ifs and, and, uh, and, and we feel the loss of the, of the inability of these two men to somehow come to terms and work together. And I would just like to hear what he had to say about that. I appreciate that. So I don't know if you know how we put together these questions, but, and, and Kyle, I was explaining earlier, the way we saved the, uh, Wardenclyff was with a crowdfunding campaign where we raised $1.4 million in six weeks from 108 countries, 33,000 donors. Wow. That crowd has just grown. We put the opportunity to ask these questions out to the crowd. So we've taken the aggregate questions that were asked the most, and that's what you're getting asked. Right. So the next question is from so beautiful, and this was asked by several people. Uh, and it is, it's the simple question of, we know that this is a, 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 something that you were motivated to do for quite some time. What motivated you to do this film? The early start came when I was 16, I got a hold of a book called Prodigal Genius, which you're probably familiar with. It's sort of a primary book. It came out a year after Tesla died, 1944, written by a man who knew Tesla and was dazzled by him and was pretty reverent, but he was a good writer and, and it's a very exciting book. And it's a, an airbrushed portrait in many respects, but it's, it's full of drama. And I could just picture this man having adventures with light and lightning and new technologies. And it was very exciting to imagine, because I had an imagination back then that was pretty vivid, imagine what that movie could be like. And, um, and I was also aware, and I still am, that there's something poignant about not only Tesla's successes, but his failures. And, and, the, and it seemed that there was something to be said or to be wrestled with about how our country didn't fully acknowledge or embrace his ideas, how, how in some ways he was a forgotten or a thwarted man. And, you know, I, I wrote a script when I was 21 and it was, I got an agent, it was optioned. There was a suspenseful heightened moment when I thought it could get made. And in those nearly 40 years since, um, lots changed in me and in the world and in the world of Tesla scholarship. So the script, there may be five scenes that are truly intact from that script, but there's a lot that is very different. And, um, and I began to reconsider and rethink a lot of these aspects. And I, I want to say that the movie we made, it was always meant, I mean, Ethan, Ethan was involved at a crucial point and helped with the script in ways that were very significant and helpful to put it mildly. And the movie really wouldn't have been made without him. So we, we made something that I'll say we, without trying to be grand about it, we made something that's very particular, very subjective and very personal. And I would like to think there'll be more Tesla movies, that there'll be bigger, more expansive movies. This is very focused on about 15 years of his life. We cut off the story around 1901 and he lived till 1943. So, um, so what we mean, I mean, some degree of humility and even though we had a low budget, though, it's, it's, I think it's an ambitious film. And I'll leave it off at that, but I, I want it, I hope it can speak for itself, but obviously here we're, we're here speaking about it. But it was, you can't at, attach, attack this subject without being ambitious. Tesla raises the bar. He was so um, undeniably brilliant that no matter, no matter how myth mythological and comic booky some of the stories are about him, the truth is still breathtaking. So that was the starting point. You know, the, the, the movie has created a bit of magic, Michael, in that I don't know any other, other inventors where a movie gets pre-screened at their historic lab and has, you know, how many countries piping in? Uh, we said 14 countries and 30 different states for, for, for a pre-screening. Um, he's being talked about now, and that's important. He was almost forgotten, so thank you. Uh, Ethan, the next question's for you. Uh, you're well known for your intensive effort of getting into character. What was the process of becoming Tesla like? What did it involve? Uh, what aspects of his character could you identify with most personally? Well, what a wonderful question. Um, this is one of those parts where you can do nothing but come up short. 
you can only meet the wall of your talent. You know, I, you can never do as good a job as should be done. What I tried to do was A, to make Michael happy. Michael had a take on Tesla and how he might be relevant today and why he might be relevant to cinema, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a documentary. It's Michael Amareda's Tesla, right? There's, but I also felt an obligation to embody him in a way that was authentic. And so all I tried to do was read as much as I could. And I would, we live in a wonderful age where I would, I would just read letters of Tesla and essays he wrote and things he said, and I would try to memorize them and I would film myself on my phone and I would send them to Michael. Um, just to start to hear his voice, just so that Michael and I could be in dialogue with him. Um, I find something very intense and beautiful about the great scientists with the great religious minds. There, there's always an intersection, whether you're talking about Einstein or Tesla or, uh, you know, Michelangelo, who, whoever you want to, Da Vinci, whoever you want to be thinking about, there's an intersection of religion and science that is really exciting to me. And it's an intersection that often creates art. And I hoped that we could use the camera and, and drama to create something that is art. It's not Tesla, it's not who he is. He's very beautiful and specific, but we could make art that could speak to now. And that was my goal. Thank you. And, and Kyle, a, a similar question that popped up was what aspects of Edison did you most like or dislike and how did it inform your portrayal of his character and, and getting ready to put, portray him? Um, I uh, spent uh, a great deal of time reading about him, books that were provided by Michael, a research, um, and also had the advantage of some film that existed of him just moving through space, um, which I found really helpful in developing the character. I guess I approach these things um, where I try to put the skin on, I guess, and that includes movement, voice, sound, everything, and try to figure out why that, that why the character, why the person moves through space the way he does and makes those choices and, and what, how it affects his inner life. So lots and lots of questions. I found Edison to be, um, you know, I, when you come to a character, of course, you don't, you know, you have ideas about him and there's, you've read things about him and people's perceptions of him, but I kind of threw all that away and, and I really fell in love with the man. I, I, I appreciated his um, absolute, um, almost bullish drive to find the answer. Um, it's not something that I possess myself. Uh, I tend to get bored and veer off in some tangent very easily, but I found his, his ability to persevere uh, to, the, to the bitter end uh, to come up with the, the answer or the result um, compelling and challenging uh, as an actor. Um, that was one thing I really, really dug into, and and I don't think he, I don't think he had an appreciation for the magic of what Tesla was or who he was, and I, I feel it fell a little bit on deaf ears on him. I'm not sorry to be funny on that, but um, <laughs> and it was, uh, but uh, um, you know, I, I, I come, and then the roundabout, another answer is to come back to say that the, the dynamic between Ethan and I, when we're working together was really helped establish Edison. So it's kind of a mix of things. There's my own work, um, the work in the scene while I'm, while I'm actually bouncing off of Ethan and then Michael, you know, kind of overseeing everything and, and moving and shifting the elements slightly. It's, all these sort of contribute to this, um, what I think is uh, really a special film. You know, I, 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 just a, a quick follow-up question. I know it came in, in, in from the crowd as well, 
but uh, while I have you speaking, I have to ask, uh, was it Edison asking Tesla if he wanted pie, or was that Kyle McLaughlin in the tip of the hat of, uh, of your love of pie and some of your other characters? I never asked, Michael. I have no idea, Mark. <laughs> in, my, in my deep research, I learned that Edison really loves pie. Okay. That he, he went to Paris for the first time. He was disappointed by the French food. He said, we really need more pie. So the <laughs> fact that, that David Lynch and Agent Cooper are also fond of pie yeah. made it a <laughs> richer. If you, if you dig down through my resume, you'll see every character I've ever played has some affinity with pie. So there it is, common thread. I think you know. through the cast, I thought that was spot on. <laughs> so this actually comes from a, a director that did a, um, a documentary on, on Tesla and, and on the project of saving the property here, Joe Sikorsky. Uh, who, who uh, directed Tower to the People. And he said, with the, the talent pool for this, for this project is truly remarkable. Was there any ad-libbing or uh, was it, you know, did you, do you have any chance to riff with each other and were the, what, what section of the movie would that have happened? I think they ad-libbed on the ice cream. I don't think I directed that very specifically. <laughs> um, I tend to, maybe it's, Maybe it's a kind of cowardice, or maybe it's because the schedule is so tight. There wasn't much ad living. There was, again, Carl and Ethan were involved and in my mind early on, because it took a long time to raise the money, but Ethan was more actively involved in developing the script. And instead of ad living, he, he um, helped with the script. And one of my favorite lines in the movie is, I, I don't mind crediting it to Ethan, it's when, when uh, Zagetti's assistant says, Ann Morgan, a girl like that all your, could make all your dreams come true. And Ethan's response was, all my dreams are true. And it felt so right to what Tesla, in his, in his wisdom and his egotism, would declare. It seemed like a profound summing up. And I'm very glad that that line wasn't quite improv, but it was suggested. And so I'm always grateful for that kind of contribution. You but, know, go ahead. If I if I can speak, you know, there's a great deal of energy put to the idea of improv and film, and it never really works. I mean, even if you talk about Cassavetes and Shadows and a, a film that he said was improvised, if you dig pretty deep, it really wasn't improvised. It, it, even if, if things are successfully improvised, they're improvised out of a collective dialogue where people are really in sync with one another about what they're trying to say. The idea that you can make something worth another person paying money to see without thinking seriously about what it says. I, I, I've been making movies, you know, for 30 years or whatever, and I, I, I've never found that to be true. It, sometimes there's a little, little tiny spark that flies off that has to do with the way the wind blows or lightning strikes, but, but it strikes that way because of the way people were working before then, right. if that makes sense. Yes, I, I, having spent some time on Portlandia, which is mostly an improv show, you depend very heavily on the director and the editor, more specifically, <laughs> to make something happen. But I, I will say that I felt speaking of the ice cream cone scene, because we were, it's one of those things where when you're in sync with someone like Ethan, when we work together, we, it's a great, because we're both looking for that moment without trying to hit it. You know, you try to touch it. That's all you just try or even glance at it, you know? And so to find the rhythm of that ice cream back and forth and where it should go and how it should play was really just, that was a little bit of, you know, just object discovery, really, just right in there and allowing each other to be present and to play. And I, and I, I really enjoyed that. Thanks. What, what Kyle just said is actually, I mean, this is so beautiful because that's how magic, in my experience, whether it's with any time when the cameras are rolling with me, it has to do with the relationship 
between an actor to actor. And there's some kind of mystery that happens with people who understand each other when good, good moments happen by accident, but they're not by accident. There's some other dialogue happening in the sky and it's a little hard to, you know, to put into words. Mm. Oh, good. Well so, Ethan, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to say, you know, I, I was a, a state legislator in this community when the community came to me and said we had to save this lab. And I didn't know who Nikola Tesla was. They had to educate me. And once I learned how important he was, I became an evangelist. And most people get touched by Tesla in some way and can't leave the project. But for you, were you aware of his contributions before seeing the script? And, and, and if so, do you remember uh, what, what first made you acquainted with Nikola Tesla? Well, you have to understand that Michael and Kyle and I first worked together in the early 90s on a movie written by William Shakespeare called Hamlet. And Michael was already had, I mean, you'd already written this script Tesla before then and if you're a serious person interested in philosophy and science and art and stuff you hear the name Tesla coming up all the time I mean it just it bubbles up everywhere I'll never forget I once I swear I think it was 20 and I was working construction you know to try to save money for college and the guy who was doing the stone masonry told me, you know, you need to read an article about Nikola Tesla. I mean, Tesla, even though he's seemingly forgotten, he permeates every person who feels lost, who feels ignored, and who cares. There's something about his energy and his insight, his wisdom, and his, the fact that he is not Edison. No offense, Kyle. <laughs> um, that I think both. you need both you there, need both in the world and a part of what I love about Michael's script is he imagines a moment where if they could work together and that I, I think when the Beatles happen when the Rolling Stones happen when something magical happens is when great minds find a way to forego their ego and work together mm. and the idea that Edison and Tessa if they had joined forces, they could have achieved the impossible and led humanity forward. That yeah. did not happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that would have been one of my next questions based on what you were saying is, I see the two of them as a yin and a yang, a purist inventor and someone that really knew how to commercialize invention. And mm. if they had gotten together, what could they have accomplished? Mm. Um, Michael, you, know, you, you mentioned the prodigal genius. Where else did you draw uh, some of your inspiration from or some of the facts that you were, you were layering into the movie? I think I've read every book and I, I think I've liked every book. There have been nothing, the major books have been well-researched and, and on the whole, well-written and passionate. They're all passionate. But the book that, when, I, when it came time to get serious about revising my, my juvenile script, the book that was probably most helpful was The Truth About Tesla. That's almost the most recent by, I think, Christopher, I was, I'm embarrassed to say, the, is it Cooper, was it? Could it? His name has suddenly flown out of my head. But it's a book that acknowledges and absorbs all the preceding books, references them, and, it, and it's specifically about tracking Tesla's story through, through the patents. It's someone who knows about history, but also knows about law. And so there's a kind of an underground layer that's truly, truly fascinating and, and, and revelatory. And it's a beautifully illustrated book. I should be able to, before the night's over, jump up and broadcast the title. Because are you familiar with this book? I'm Cause, not. Because Seifert, who's, who's kind of the more, more prominently known expert, he wrote an introduction to the book. But this book is, um, it's the most recent. And, there, and in the back, for, for people who, who can't read, you know, have a lot of scientific, um, sometimes things are a bit too dense. There are five myths about Tesla that are just so, it's so good to clear the air. One of the myths is that 
Tesla and Edison weren't necessarily rivals to that extent. It's been, it's been exaggerated. And there's a book that came out after we finished shooting that's quite wonderful, a new biography of Edison, that explains that when Tesla's lab burned up, something that's not in the movie, it's not something we could afford to dwell on. But in 1895, when Edison, when Tesla lost his lab, Edison offered Tesla to use his lab and Tesla used it. It was in New Jersey. He didn't use it for long, but there was enough open air between the two men, he did reach out and he did have sympathy and he wasn't a villain, he wasn't even a nemesis. And in some ways he wasn't a rival because to say that Edison and Tesla were rivals is like saying Steven Soderbergh's arrival with Steven Spielberg. They were on very different levels. They were both brilliant and they didn't, I, I think they were both in their way pure. I think Edison ha had a more cunning business sense but he also made terrible disastrous incredible business fiascos, you know? It's just the more you read about it, the more amazing it was. And I was also moved to learn that when, Ed when Tesla came back from Colorado, he gave a lecture and Edison attended. He came a little late, interrupted. Tesla got off off the podium, shook his hand and led Edison to his seat. So, you know, the, the invented scene that's in the movie where they try to make amends, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily that far it was far enough off to be painfully impossible but there was something between the two that that makes me think their affinities were perhaps stronger than their differences so that's just um to get back to what, what books were meaningful i'd say they're, they're all meaningful because they're all amazing and it's interesting that you have someone in your audience apparently who's working on a new book there's room for more there's definitely room for more appreciate that so, Michael, uh, did, did Tesla really smoke? Well, he did when he was young. And I think, I think either I told Ethan that and he said no one will care or I could imagine him saying it if I did tell him that. So there are, you know, Edison was smoking a lot. I think Ethan, Ethan was inspired to, um, to, to have a cigarette a couple times. I think there are, what, three scenes where he's smoking? So in reality, Tesla was a nicotine addict when he was a student. So we imagine maybe he, 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 got, he got a little bit, um, a resurgence of the appetite. But it was, um, we have to say it's artistic license in that part of his life. Ethan, do you have any, did you do any further research? Do you remember this? We, you have to re realize we shot the movie in a blur. It was very, very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well the, the scene with the skating, Ethan, how are your skating skills in real life? Because watching you guys in that scene, it was, it was, an, it was an interesting scene. It was a lot of energy in it. Well, for me, you know, people who talk about making movies often think about it differently than the people making movies, right? And for me, making the movie and getting to roller skate it's such a beautiful thing to have to live a character in such a tactile way. My first kiss was roller skating. I was at the Hamilton Roller Rink in New Jersey, and I met this beautiful young woman who had an Ozzy Osbourne t-shirt on, and we kissed. And roller skating to me is profound because of that experience. And now we started our movie the first day, the movie opens with it, but roller skating to me is a tactile, um, I don't know what the right word is. It's, it's not an uh, intellectual idea. It's something that makes you touch life. And so getting to start playing this character, roller skating was profound to me. And I'm not scared to say it. <laughs> 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 you know it puts everyone on equal footing i remember in this in the original script michael ah. wasn't we, weren't we all ice skating uh yeah. was everyone ice skating but we hit and, the wrong uh, season we shot in may and and <laughs> ice skating we, it wasn't open air ice skating was not available to us this is what i love about the script because you you read the script and you're like oh my god an ice skating rink many people costumes around new york how are we going to do that cut to the reality which i think is incredibly effective 
and so much more interesting that you're in a house, you're in a contained environment where we can shoot and where we, you know, can be there for a day. And you move and maneuver through this labyrinth of rooms. I just think it's... And it's actually like, historically um, accurate. I found out I, roller skating was popular at that point. And we mm -hmm. used, we had period roller skates, which the actors were able to suffer through without anyone killing oh, themselves. It was fantastic. I'm just glad you didn't ask. Was it was JP really Morgan's cool. house that they were skating in? Because that would probably be pretty appropriate too. Say so that again? Was it JP Morgan's house that they were skating in? Well, <laughs> the sanitizer was, but it was it was actually within the Guggenheim's estate. We found a an accommodating mansion that had been owned by the Guggenheim's. But uh, Ethan, you never told me that story. I'm glad to. I'm glad we're having this conversation. <laughs> Very good. I like what you said, Michael. An accommodating mansion. I gotta. That's that. Yeah. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael, a, a question from a, a good friend of the Tesla Science Center, Justin Palman, out of Austin, Texas. What was your thought process behind deciding to have your characters break time and narrative conventions? For example the Tesla Edison ice cream cone fight and narrating as a moderner with internet access, Edison pulling out a smartphone at the bar. We, we talked about this a little before, but I was determined to make an unconventional movie about an unconventional man. And in a way, reality has caught up with me because it's, it's not that unconventional to have people talking to the camera and, and, or even to break time. We have movies like Hamilton and the big short and the, TV show about Emily Dickinson and the TV show about Catherine the Great. So I can't even say it's that uncon unconventional, but in my mind, it was a way of acknowledging how history is a kind of collage that we, we gather from scraps, often from the internet, where time travel is a very casual and, and, um, and transfiguring process. And that we're always kind of gliding through a hall of mirrors when we're, when we're looking, when we're doing research or thinking about the past. And a lot of what we think we're learning may not even be true or we project into the future, overlap things. But it seemed appropriate for Tesla, who was a visionary, who was always projecting himself into the future. It was important to have to, to hold up the mirror to Tesla. So that's a kind of convoluted answer, but it's, it, 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 it reflects a sort of vocabulary that we, we applied. Um. Uh, from Serbia, uh, Navina Tomasevic, can we talk about the everybody wants to rule the world scene? Um, sure. Yeah. You know, uh, what, wh where'd that come from, Michael? That was a late addition as the script got increasingly lean for different reasons. I realized that I wanted, and, and Ethan encouraged a sense of, uh, we wanted to get closer to Tesla and to get into his inner life. It's what it gets back to the first question you asked. And there are, there are occasions when people do karaoke where they reach into themselves and the song expresses something they can't say as explicitly that allows, allows certain kinds of emotion or ideas to be um, liberated or at least suggested. And, and so when I had the idea to, to have him sing a song, I wanted it to be a pop song. I wanted it to be a song everyone knows and would not expect. I wanted it to be a song that did have layers of meaning and that was also fun. And I wanted um, Ethan's blessing. So we, we talked about it at length and we, we took a risk because we didn't have the rights at the time. And I was very lucky that a fellow named Randall Poster, who's a great music supervisor, pursued the manager of the band and, and got their blessing. and we. We, we got a, a discount price, but it was not, it was very scary. And, and I think for some people, the movie snaps into focus when that scene happens. For other people, maybe the movie goes off the cliff, but I was determined, I felt it was the right thing to do and Ethan embraced it. And, uh, and it, does, it does, to my mind, um, make everything that went before it come into focus a bit. And it is, it is a sort of, I hope it's magical. It's not for me to say, but but I thought Ethan, it, that in a way was improv too because you can't. It was a kind of performance where we did a few takes. It was a, one of our last days of shooting, 
And it was a, a case of seeing an actor really rise to the occasion. It was, it was inspiring to me. Did you, uh, uh, Ethan, uh, did you feel Tesla in this, in this process? Kyle, did you feel Edison in this process? I felt him, yeah, I did. Um, and, you know, and again, I, I, I so helped by just the environment, the clothing, you know, the, the, the situation, having done the research and you just embed yourself we should say hi really quickly to Sophia, our wardrobe person, who's actually Serbian. And, um, and she was someone who c created miracles every day with every outfit that she supplied for the principal actors and the, the extras. So I, can, I, can I say something? Yeah. Kyle, can I cut you off? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Please. Kyle, can I? Sophia, our costume designer, she had such a passion for Nikola Tesla, for science, for what's happening in the world today. And she worked, I mean, this woman worked, I mean, she stayed up all night trying to find me the right shoes, the right cufflinks. Yeah. And her passion made me feel when I would go in front of the camera that I would have to do my best. It was so contagious. I'm so grateful to her. And for a lot of people that don't understand making movies, what a collaborative art it is. She was so magnificent. Uh, it's very difficult. I, I get so jealous. Kyle, I know you know what I'm going to say. I don't want to be a jerk. But when you watch movies, when people have $100 million to make them, and you know that they have 20 days to shoot each scene. They have costumes, you know, they have 20 different outfits for every scene, whatever. We had to make every decision on the fly. And as hard as it, as hard as it is for the actors, it's harder for the crew. And for the set designer, for the costume designer, for the cinematographer, it's yep. even harder for them. And mm -hmm. It was what we accomplished had to do with how much people believed in Michael's vision and how much people believed in the idea that it was important to tell a story about Tesla right now. And the fact that we're telling this story from the vantage point of a pandemic even yeah. highlights why it is so important. Um, the integration of science and art and religion and how we live our lives is so essential to how we think. And I don't know, I'm so grateful to be a part of this simply for that. Does that make sense? Completely, completely. I think I would also add that when you're working <clears throat> in an independent way as we were, I mean, this was super independent maybe, you rely on inspiration from everyone around you and they rely on you. And the big movies that you're talking about, it's a different situation. You know, there's a separation. But when you're in the trenches, as we were on this, then, you know, I, I like you, I would come in to work the next day and there would be some little extra piece of the costume, the wardrobe that would have been added that she went the extra mile to get to add and you know, those are the things that as a, as an actor, you, you, you carry with you, you know, and you take them to heart and they inspire and they lift you, I think. And that's, that's one of the joys of working independent, I think. So, so Michael, the one character that I've heard about in Tesla's past was Mark Twain. Did you think about pulling him into this in some way or, what made you decide not, not to put Twain into the movie? Was he just not a big character in his life or? Well, I mean, I, I have a wistful and bittersweet answer. I was, um, I was going to have, give him a significant role and Sam Shepard was going to play him, who was a, a friend and the film's dedicated to him. When mm. Sam got sick, I just couldn't imagine anyone else taking on the role. And, and uh, I think the relationship with Twain and Tesla is exaggerated in, a lot of accounts, I don't think they were that close, but I think it's fascinating 
it's, it's incredible to picture them together and to imagine how close they might have been. You know, there are science fiction books where they solve intergalactic mysteries. You know, there are comic books where they're, they're dressed like um, road warrior bikers with leather gloves and belts and goggles. There's, there's something about the pairing that invites a kind of superhero dynamic duo mentality. But when, when Sam died, I, you know, the last time I talked to him, we were talking about Tesla, but it just, it felt then everything just was a little ashen to me and I didn't want to, to uh, have a substitute. So that was, and, 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 you know, the budget was something pressing in on us at all times. So that's, it's a worthwhile question, but I, I deflected that possibility. That's maybe there'll be a sequel with, with someone else. Someone else can make that, you know? Very good. Uh, I'm going to have one final question, but first I just want to do a shout out to Kristen Iverson, who uh, is an author. Uh, she's joining us on the chat today. I asked one of her questions earlier about how you did your research. She's working on a Tesla book now, and she was the author of Molly Brown. So uh, Kristen, thank you for joining us. And Tungsten from uh, Serbian Media, I want to thank you for joining. So my final question to, to each of you, um, you know, I gave a little bit of a briefing on what we're doing here to try to celebrate Tesla. We saved his last lab. We're opening it as a museum and as a science center, uh, celebrating the past and him and his contemporaries. So Kyle, we're not going to forget about Edison here. We're going to talk about him a little bit here too. And we'll have a relationship with the Edison lab, but it's really about Tesla here. Uh, but we are going to celebrate the innovators of today. Who, who, who are the Teslas of today? Um, who should we be celebrating today? Who are the Edisons of today? And, um, and then how do we inspire the, the Teslas of tomorrow? So uh, in addition to a museum and science center, the thought pattern is a business accelerator that helps the Teslas of today who needed that yin and the yang that we talked about earlier. Uh, but, you know, so knowing that that is our, our, our general plan here, what advice, having been so close to this subject matter, for you know, to to make this movie, what advice do you have for us? You know, uh, you know, I'm gonna let Michael end that, end on that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with uh, Kyle. Would you like to give us some advice for the Tesla Science Center? What would you like to see us do here? Oh boy, um, <laughs> you need a statue of Edison out front. I think, <laughs> first of all, oh, it'll um, be a small one. <laughs> Um, I know, I think it's, I would answer that by saying to pr pursue what um, Michael had, has done with this film, which, which is to bring Tesla and, and make him current. Um, sorry, again, bad choice of words. Um, but anyway. Um, I love your bring, puns. <laughs> thank you, sorry. To bring him here, you know, to make him, make him live and breathe as if he's alive now, because he really is. And his inventions are still important. And uh, so I would, that's what I would say. Just, just, you know, make him live. Thank you. And Ethan, uh, what advice do you have for us? What would you like to see us launch here in New York? I mean, not to be corny, but I, I feel like the whole science community, the job of the next 50, years is dedicated to climate change and teaching the citizens of the world and helping push us forward as to how we can heal the planet. Um, every individual crisis that happens, political wars, all these different things that distract us, uh, they're real. I'm not saying they're not real, but how we care for our planet and how we respect science is essential to our living forward. And I think the main job of every scientific community is to teach young people to care about uh, the interconnected nature of the universe and that nobody wins if everybody doesn't win uh, and to take that forward. Does that make you follow me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, Michael, first to thank you for doing, you know, thank you again. Film. Um, Ethan's answer is so good. I, I can mainly just kind of echo it and underline it, but
but he's, you've also reminded me that we had enormous support in making the film from the Sloan Foundation. And I, I, don't, I hope you're familiar with them, but they, they helped nurture the script and gave a, a grant for helping fill a gap when we were shooting the movie. But they are very plugged into this idea of, of um, nurturing projects among artists and I think among scientists to, to, to spread science in the world. And, and if it's not, as Ethan pointed out, being keyed into the environment is something that Tesla was visionary about. He didn't, there, there's a lot of mis, misinformation about him talking about free energy, but he did talk about renewable energy. He did talk about earth and wind. He talked about wind and sun. He was trying to escape the trap of fossil fuels. And it's fascinating to read these things that he was saying back then. So I mentioned the Sloan Foundation on a practical level, and I'm sure there are many other organizations that I'd recommend you collaborate with because, because the key is to activate that both curiosity and a sense of, of passionate necessity in young people. I think they, many of them have it, but it's, it's all about recognizing that the future belongs to them and that that whatever you can do it as an outreach program, you know, I, I don't know anything about that. All I know is that that's the direction I would, I would want to push the energy in because it's one thing to have a museum that memorializes what's been done and Tesla deserves that. But, but if you can also move forward into the future and inspire and, and, and fund people, that seems like the ideal way to, to proceed. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I, I want to thank uh, Michael Almereda, Ethan Hawke, Kyle McLaughlin. You know, I didn't say this earlier, but um, my next door neighbor is a, a screenwriter, Rob Lieber. He wrote a, a movie uh, two years ago called Goosebumps 2. And he, uh, the, the, the inspiration was my, my, my kids and my wife. I was written out of it. But that was truly a remarkable uh, experience to watch that go to film. This is right there uh, with it, to be able to watch your screen, your, 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 your pre-screen movie at the Tesla lab with a lightning show above it. Uh, I don't think I'll ever forget tonight. I can't uh, thank IFC Films enough for making this such a special uh, birthday celebration for Tesla and making us a part of this. Uh, wanna thank uh, the TSCW, the board, Jane, for joining us. And I want to thank Nikola Tesla for being such a selfless inventor and uh, giving us so much in terms of wireless, alternating current. Uh, you know, he didn't die a rich man, but he definitely made an enormous impact on the world. So uh, from all of us here tonight, happy birthday, Nikola Tesla. Good night. Happy birthday. Good night.